Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're welcome. I'm Linda Pastore. I'm the Director of Development for KJZZ and KBOC Radio, your public radio stations. We're so glad you could join us this morning. This is our third roundtable. Uh, and this morning, I think it'll be something interesting that perhaps you haven't heard before. Hopefully, that's what public radio does for you each and every day. And you enjoy the classical selections you hear on KBOC and the news and journalism that you hear on KJZZ. So welcome. Uh, just a few directives. Uh, the ladies and gentlemen's bathroom is here to the right. And please help yourselves to as much coffee and rolls as you can take this morning. I have uh, the pleasure to... Uh, to read the bio and um, welcome Tom Helms to us this morning. Tom is the owner of AZ Appraisal and Estate Consultants in Phoenix. He has four appraisers and a number of outside specialists that he works with. He's senior member of the International Society of Appraisals, national organization and a member of Certified Appraisers Guild of America. His specialty designation is antiques and residential contents and is known as a generalist personal property appraiser. For more than 25 years, Tom has also been actively buying and selling antiques, collectibles, and decorative arts. By keeping his finger on the pulse of the market, it has strengthened his keen sense about trends and values, especially when working with appraisals. Tom was a member of the board of directors for the Rossum House, a living museum in Phoenix First, 1895 Victorian. He also writes a monthly column Ask the Appraiser for Sun Life, a magazine for retirees in the greater Sun City area, and was a guest appraiser for a reality show, The Auctioneers on TLC, and Baggage Battles on the Travel Channel. Join me in welcoming Tom Helms. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you continue that when I complete and say, thank God he's gone. Uh, anyway, if this is too loud, I'll turn it off. I, I taught school for 36 years and had to learn to project all the way to the back. So if this is too loud, say so. Um, Laura asked me to talk to you about values. Does, does everything have a value? Yes, it does. Everything has a value. It may not be your perceived value. It is a value that is common in the market today. Uh, for example, <clears throat> all this paper on the table has value. Uh, it has a donation value to you. You can take it down to the Center for the Blind, which is the largest recycling uh, company in Arizona. They bring all of the recyclable of, of paper. They'll weigh it. They will give you an estimated value of it, and that can be your tax write-off. So your trash is valuable. Uh, and we can work from there, which is the lowest level of value, into... Um, you, you should have read it. Which is the lowest value? Salvage. Somebody did their homework. Salvage is the lowest value <coughs> that we have. Um, you know, if you don't plan your estate well, your money, your properties, your stocks, your bonds, all your hard assets are pretty well decided. It's your personal property that keeps me in business. <coughs> Because remember when you did your trust, it says, what is your personal property that you want to move into the trust? Most of you never got to that. Uh, and you neglected that. And I really thank you for not doing that. Uh, because what happens is that I get a call from your attorney saying, Tom, you need to go to XY's house. We need to move all the personal property into the trust. And I need to have a valuation of it. And we do a great deal of that. Uh, I work for three different attorneys who that is a requirement for upper echelon uh, clients is that we're called, we come in, do an inventory list, it's transferred in, and he then uses that appraisal report as a segue to communicate with you and you to communicate with him. It helps with your gifting, it helps with the disposal of items, it helps you sit down with your children and say, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? <clears throat> and, uh, the, I, and I'm going to tell you the common denominator of people, they wind up saying, Mom, we have everything. I really don't want any of that. What do you mean? These dishes have been in the family since 2000, <coughs> 1905, 
and here it is 2013 and you don't want these dishes? No, Mom, I really don't. And it goes from there on down. Um, we have a phenomena, again, occurring with decorative arts. There's uh, something that's happening within our society where the younger people are turning loose of the past and of furnishings because it doesn't fit with the decor. They are not following along with heirlooms. We just handled a very large estate out of Tucson. And the items had been in the family since 1820. Uh, and they had Victoriana, they had you name it, they had it. We had to do the appraisal for the trust, to move into the trust. None of the family member wanted anything because there was only one survivor left, and that individual was 72. He had no heirs, and he didn't want any of it. And so where was that estate going to go? Um, this was a very substantial family in Tucson, and they didn't want their stuff going out into the market in Tucson. So we made arrangements through one of the local auction houses here that I highly endorse. They went down and five truckloads later brought it up and sold it here. Uh, and it did very, very well. But it was very sad to see revolutionary memorabilia, uh, Civil War memorabilia, World War I, World War II, Korean, just the whole esselage of items that, that went. And so you might be able to avoid that if you are at the end of, uh, of the line and you have children who are not interested in things, get the report, and then find out far-fetched family members or other people who would like to carry on the lint. Um, <clears throat> so that's one sad story, which, as I said, I really thank the attorneys that don't push you to get that personal property in into your trust. Um, and I'm talking about things, I'm not talking about the toaster. I'm, I'm talking about art, uh, your jewelry, your furnishings, your antiques, your memorabilia as such. Because another reason why I'm happy about it is disputes uh, develop. And you keep the lid on disputes because children behave themselves and heirs behave themselves because you have done your job of keeping family balance. When, sadly, one of you goes to the happy hunting grounds, uh, the bad things start coming out. <clears throat> right now we have three on the books where bad things have come out. I mean, very bad things. Um, where a daughter will go into the house and take everything because mom gave it to me. Because <clears throat> the other daughter was not the favorite one, and she knew that the other daughter was wanting the same things, and so off it goes. Um, we have not fighting over the monies, it's fighting over the things. The one we're doing in Litchfield Park right now is uh, <clears throat> the brother and sister have stopped speaking. They, uh, the sister has two attorneys, the brother has two attorneys, the bank is overseeing the trust, so can you see the, the bloodletting that's going on right now out of the financial parts of this because of disagreements that you could have stopped if you'd had the personal property appraisal all done and designated where it was to go and why it was to go to the various and sundry people. Um, <clears throat> it's a sad world when one of the balances leaves and life becomes not balanced. We're dealing with another estate that we have been trying to work with the attorneys since June. And this is an estate, and tune up if this fits into you, is we have a husband and wife, and it's second marriage for both, and we have her children and his children, and <clears throat> this second marriage didn't go as quite as honeymooned as it was. In fact, he was planning on leaving her after 25 years, had met with an attorney, and he did the favor of dying and left her in a mess. But he named his daughter the PR. And the daughter can't stand the stepmother, and the stepmother's children can't stand her, so the battles have begun. Uh, and it finally wound up in court where we have been assigned as the appraiser to go in and force a value of everything, and she had packed up all of the valuables already. So 
we had gone in and said, you have to unpack all of this because you will not like our bill uh, if we have to go through all of this. So those are some little scenarios of real life situations that you don't hear about uh, that, that's going on that you can stop while you are still have all your faculties about you. Uh, at least I think I have some of mine left, I don't know. Um, you know, since everything has a value that I was talking about, some of that value is intrinsic. You look at something, and I had a call yesterday from Sedona. A man was watching um, Antique Roadshow. I said, the Antique Roadshow is strictly entertainment. Please understand that. Uh, when I was in the Rawson House board and when the Antique Roadshow came to Phoenix, uh, we helped coordinate with the Heritage Square and the Antique Roadshow and I'm going to tell you some secrets about the Antique Roadshow. Um, you know that in, in the early years, a number of the appraisers got into some pretty bad trouble. Some of them were in prison because of what they pulled. Uh, things have happened that's a little bit, um, uh, oh, not as blatant, but it's still going on. Let's say that I wanted to be an appraiser on Antiques Roadshow. So I fill out all the applications and get in, and they say, okay, Tom, you're really great. We're going to have you in. Our next uh, event is going to be in Seattle, um, and it's going to be at this, hotel, uh, this place. Here's the hotel information. I have to pay my way to go. I have to pay my way into the show, and <clears throat> there will be a numerous number of appraisers there. So here all of us are appraisers that have been brought into the Antique Roadshow because literally thousands of people bring their family treasures in, and it's impossible for one or two or three of the top, top appraisers to do all of that. So they'll come to art. And he says, you, that's just really nice stuff. Yeah, it's worth about $25. And then you come in and you bring in something that's pretty exciting. Because he wants to get on the antique roadshow. He wants to be highlighted. And you have a, I'm going to call it a rare signal cannon. Anybody know what I mean by a signal can cannon? Uh, signal cannon is, they were about this big, and they were on ships, and they were at, used during war. They were also used in celebrations. The 4th of July, they were ma ma primarily made out of iron, and it was a signal to either start the race, start the cannon firing, start it. And there are some very, very rare ones out there. And if they have provenance to certain events, then you can prove that it was in that event. They have a great deal of value. So you have come in with a signal cannon. And Art says, oh, come on over here. <laughs> and he gets you all of that information. And you have the provenance. And he says, you know, this, this signal cannon is probably worth between uh, eight to $12,000. All right? So... Art then calls over, the cameraman, come on over here. Uh, I, I got something going here. And so he films all of this going on after Art has met with those three appraisers to discuss the signal cannon to see if you are worthy with that to go on. So they collect anywhere from 100 to 200 selected slices of possibilities to go on to the road show. Then the directors go through and they pick the, the creme de la creme. And sorry to say, most of art have always hit the floor. And art still goes from one show to the next show, hoping to be able listed on the antique road show. So consequently, there is some exaggeration, particularly with values that are supported by those three to help him out because one of them may come across a signal cannon and they would want him to support them. So that kind of gives you some of the shenanigans that go on in the road show. So when you watch it, you can learn a great deal about an antique. You can get some great information about its past, what it was, etc. But when it gets to the bottom line, value, let it go. Because most of the time they'll say, an estimated auction value for this is between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. They're not hung up on that, but when they said a value for this is fifteen thousand dollars, that person will go out and say, "I can get fifteen thousand dollars for this." They can't. So, 
uh, <clears throat> television and the reality shows have opened up a kind of a Pandora's box of things. How many of you have watched The Hoarders? Buried Alive? Come on. Admit it. Admit it. All right. The Hoarder show has opened, it's been canceled. This is its last season, yeah. Um, the, and I'll tell you an interesting story about the Hoarder show. But Hoarders, buried alive, thank God for them. They did this country a major favor, a huge favor. It, it, it's affected all the way the people in the health industry to our industry and has opened up an industry because it is a major disease in the country, a major disease. There are an estimated, are you ready, 17 million hoarders in this country. 17 million. An estimated in Maricopa County of close to 110,000 hoarders in Maricopa County. And when I say hoarders, there are five levels of hoarding. We have done a hoarding presentation to the Arizona uh, Fiduciary uh, uh, Convention. We have presented it to two law firms because when you deal with a hoarder client, you deal with a very difficult client because they have had some deep psychological scars happen in the environment they lived in. Uh, my youngest appraiser and my staff grew up in a hoarding house. The house killed the mother. And as I move on in my presentation, uh, I'll go in a little more detail on hoarders if you want to hear about them. <laughs> it's quite phenomenal. Um, third, I've been on baggage battles, and I've been on the auctioneers. The baggage battles will have been continued, and we would deal with values. And I'm going to tell you, reality is not all what it's... It took almost three and a half hours to film me for less than eight minutes. I didn't have the right expression when I opened the box. <laughs> you know, I didn't greet the man cordially enough because I didn't like him. Uh, it's, uh, do you ever, any of you ever watch Baggage Battles? All right, Baggage Battles. We have an obnoxious couple from, uh, from Los Angeles. He is, um, uh, he's got a mouth that runs like a flood and he's nasty. And his wife is always putting him down. And he, he, and he was getting nasty, and et cetera. And I was told, Tom, you're only talking to her. You're not talking to him. And he cut. And I said, well, you know why? I like her better than him. He won't shut up. He won't listen to me. Uh, and anyway, it was a kind of a battle going on because I didn't care whether I was going to be on it or not. Because I've seen what reality television is. It's all for show, and it's really not real. Uh, I was to appraise items that I was given a week beforehand so I could do all of the research on it, come up with all the information for them, and then pretend like I never saw it. And <clears throat> I kind of have a face that my mother knew I was in trouble. And I, when I would lie to her about it, I was in deeper trouble because she knew I was lying about it because I really did it. Um, and I, I guess that face came across. So that's basically on, on valuing in... Uh, reality shows, antique road show, what the hoarders have done for us, and general uh, stories that come about. Same thing with um, storage wars, the same thing. Um, but just enjoy it and let you know that you're getting some information. Um, well, let's kind of go back into the topic of, that I drifted away from, is <coughs> equitable distribution is probably the biggest job that we come under is you want your children or your heirs to receive equitable assets. Equitable. Because if you don't, Mary Beth is going to hate George later because George got most of it and Mary Beth only got this amount of it. And so when you have the appraisal that comes, because we're usually forced in by the attorneys to come in to make it equitable. Um, and so they are able to make a decision based upon the equitable. Because if George got more than Mary, George has to relinquish part of his monetary results in, back into the trust so that it's equal, so that he knows that she paid for that. Um, and 
basically, I, with my advice to some of the attorneys, I say, all right, here is the amount of the personal property. Mary Beth has gotten 15000 George has gotten 22000 Just have them pay the estate into it and then spread it that way. Um, so they wind up buying the objects from the, from the estate, and it's, it's just this. <clears throat> it's all on paper. Um, and that it's equally paid. So equitable distribution. And again, you can stop that by having a appraisal report, Mary Beth and George selecting what they want, and it comes to the bottom line of that it's equitable for them. Um, you know, there are six major values on things. Six. Salvage. I know some of you probably have sterling flatware you never use. It's beautiful. There it is. It's just turning the color of your chairs because it's been in there for so long. Um, you might have fine sterling serving pieces that nobody wants. You might have broken gold jewelry, silver that's there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's move it into salvage value. Um, there are certain sets of sterling that's still very collectible that's still highly prized, at, but a great deal of it, it's not. Uh, you might consider saying, who do you know will do a salvage value on it? And there's only two people that we recommend, uh, that if you ever wanted to, to sell them, and I'm not, I'm not, you give me a call and I'll give you their names, okay? If you want to have it, uh, sell it for meltdown value. Uh, <clears throat> very, very honest man that we... Uh, send to banks, trust departments, because uh, he does very well with it. Same way with, the, with gold and silver. Do not go to the barber shop to sell your gold. Uh, and there are people who do that. Uh, there's different levels of spot value on, on gold, of this day versus last week versus whatever tomorrow is going to be. But get rid of it. Spend the money and go to Hawaii again uh, and dump it. So salvage value, you can do that now. Silver plate is passe. You can go to the auctions today, and you can buy big boxes of silver plate. Nice silver plate for anywhere for the whole box from $10 to $35. People don't want it. They don't want to take care of it. You can go to the antique malls, and you will find silver plate trays, servers, bread servers, bomb bombs, the whole nine yards, anywhere from $5 to $35, and there they sit. Nobody wants it. The same thing has happened with crystal. Um, and there's some beautiful American brilliant cut crystal that just takes your breath away. And the history of, uh, of American brilliant cut crystal came about in the late 1800s at the 1892 World's Fair. Um, a group of, of men came together and they did the absolute gorgeous cuts in crystal, but that was the height of the Gilded Cage era, where crystal and silver and fine dining ware, uh, silverware sets, you could have a special olive fork, you could have a lemon fork, a strawberry fork, an ice cream spoon, all of this stuff that went with a set. And it wasn't until the 20th century that it all came into you can only have these many pieces into a silver set. So you can easily identify a silver set if it has extemporaneous pieces that were no longer being made. And it tells you that it's pre-1900. And a lot of those were melted down. When are you going to use these special serving pieces? And sorry to say, that's, that's what's happened. So anything that you think that uh, we're going to beginning to kind of declutter your house, make it easier, if you don't use any of this stuff, think about getting rid of it. And I will give you, if you give me a call, I, I, don't, I don't want to say I want you to call this auction house, I want you to call this liquidator, I want you to call this gemologist, I want you, because I get nothing out of it. You don't even have to mention my name, is that our job is... AZ appraisal and estate consultants, 
and the consultants is our Rolodex. Because every estate that we go into have other needs that have to be met. And so instead of you, I, I kind of the Emily list of it all, and say, here you are, uh, we make our bread and butter doing appraisal. And this year we have done, uh, I'm just completing the 132nd appraisal for this year. Uh, and it's like writing a mini research paper over and over, over, over. I as I said, I taught school for 36 years. And I, I taught English, language arts. I was department chair for 25 years. And I feel like I, I'm still in the process of educating, which I love. I'm still in the process of grading papers because the fellow appraisers in my, in my company, I proofread and go through everything that they've done. I double check all of their research on items that have to be researched. For example, we have a, we're doing another estate and he has a 1957 Thunderbird, for, uh, Thunderbird uh, hardtop. And he had been trying to sell it for $36,500 for six months. And he was, not to, he was not supposed to sell the car because the appraisal had not been done for the estate because it's a taxable estate, meaning that it's worth between five and $10 million, this estate. Um, so he was bemoaning the fact that he couldn't get uh, any bids whatsoever, and the attorney already slapped his hands for trying to sell it. And it had been on the market for six months. And I said, you know that I know that we know why you're not getting the amount of money that you're asking for that car. And I, I said, do you want me to tell you or do you want you to tell me? I said, number one, and any of you in classic cars, um, cars that have been completely redone don't have that value. The cars that have the value it's like a fine piece of antique furnishing or a, a wonderful original artwork. It wants to be original. So if you have the seats from that 1957 Thunderbird and you have taken them out and they're in storage, that gives you more value because you have the original seat and you just put in this temporary seat for you to go around in because you're keeping the original seat. Does it have the original paint? Does it have the original motor? Does it have everything as possibly possible on that vehicle to be original? Why do you think that huge amount of cars that were, that were parked out in South Dakota or North Dakota, wherever it was, the Chevrolet dealership that went kaputch, and he had 125 cars parked out in the field that had been sitting there for 30 to 40 years? They had all of their original parts, and they went through the roof on value. I said... This, is, this whole thing is a retro thing. I said, even your side windows are plexiglass. <laughs> they look nice. And I, I said, every part of this car has been painted fire engine red. Fire engine red is the most common color that people have painted the Thunderbirds. And it is the least car that will command the greatest amount of money. And we did the research on the numbers to find out that the car was originally a light gray and a seafoam green. And, he, and it was probably very ugly to him when they bought the car 20 years ago. But today that car would have commanded $40,000 if it had the original color. And I hate to tell him that he will probably be able to sell the car between twenty two and 24000 not his 36000 that we're reporting to. So giving you an idea of what we appraise, uh, we appraise, as I said, vintage cars going into it, but art is a big thing. We, um, those of you who go to the Phoenix Art Museum, I can't give you the name of the painting because it'll tell you who the client is because he's very well known. It's a half a million dollar painting that he donated to the Phoenix Art Museum that is showcased in the Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, <clears throat> and that painting is continuing to escalate in value. That's one of the top 5% of art. And I've asked Laura, if I haven't bored you to death, another presentation that if you like, it's valuing art on the secondary market. What, are, what's your, what is your work then? So that can be one that you can toss around and, and chat with her about. Um, 
but we deal with a great deal of art, and I'm sure all of you have decorative art hanging in your house, and some of you think that painting is worth $5,000. We look at everything on the secondary market. The secondary market. And that leads us into, I've talked about salvage value. Uh, <clears throat> and when I say secondary market, what is the market value of that painting? Where can I go buy that painting uh, in the secondary market? And I asked Laura, I said, Laura, where you, your, your son doesn't like that painting and it has to be gotten rid of, where could you go buy that painting? Volunteer, where, where do you think you could go buy the art in your house that nobody wanted and it's hauled off? Where could I go buy it? Thrift stores, auctions, swap meets, garage sales. I did a presentation for the Arizona Watercolor Society and the Arizona um, Artists Guild. And my former principal is a very good artist. He's been, he's been retired for 30 years. I mean, really nice art. And I said to him, his name is Norm, I said, Norm, what's your value of your art? He said, I don't care, I just do it to pay. He says, I don't charge a lot of money, anywhere between $300 to $1,000 for my work, depending on what it is, et cetera. I said, that's the primary market. But I want it on the secondary market. And he says, well, my son came home. He says, Dad, look what I found at a garage sale for $5. And held up one of his works. And I said, Norm, that's what you're worth. I even thought you were worth $5 when you were a principal. <laughs> Five bucks, that's it. Um, but I said, what do you need to do to elevate that for your clients? So sorry to tell you, a lot of your art is decorative in its nature. And in another presentation, well, I'll tell you right now. Uh, <clears throat> this was an estate that we did, and it was in Paradise Valley. And, and those of you who are familiar with Paradise Valley know that homes that were built in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s had a Spanish motif to them. Red tiles, low, and had that western, southwestern, Mexican theme to it. Consequently, the art that went in it had to support the value of, of the appearance of the house. There were two artists that were highly sought after during that period of time that charged a lot of money and their work were done very nicely and this one house they thought they were investing in it, never invest in art. Buy it because you like it, buy it because it looks good on your walls, don't buy art for investments because it's like the stock market, like this and then so they had close to $250,000 of art on their walls based upon an appraisal report in 1991. And we're handling it through an accounting firm who was their personal representative. And they said, Tom, where are we going to sell this art? I said, well, let me do some research first. And there were probably 60 paintings in the house, not all of them by the uh, same two artists only one by a really good artist. Well, when I met with him, I said, you know that $250,000 worth of art? You're probably going to get less than $1,000 on it all. You're kidding. I said, no. Um, let me pick up the phone, call on a speakerphone, and I'll call Terry Hardy of Bonham's Auction House. And I'll give her the names of the two artists. So I did. I said, Terry, I have a great deal of art here for you that might be interested in Bonham. So I gave one of the artists names. She says, no, we're not interested in that one. He has no value anymore. I gave the other artist. She says, we'll take that one. And he still didn't believe me. So I called the Scottsdale auction, uh, art auction. They have an auction once a year in April. And they start collecting art for that auction. Did the same thing. Was told the same thing. He says, Tom, how are we going to get rid of this art? I said, you're going to do it through a local auction here. And I said, it's not going to bring much. Not much at all. And it didn't. It brought less than $1,000 uh, for the 14 paintings done by this artist. And so the bottom fell out of it because it was not decorative that went with the style of furnishings today. Uh, so what you may think has a great deal of value that you bought in 1980, 2000, and early 2000 may have absolutely minimal value in today's market based upon the demands. 
There's two others that I skipped over. That's forced liquidation and orderly liquidation. I bet I get anywhere between five and ten phone calls a day. Tom, I have blah, 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 blah to sell. I need an appraisal on it. I say, I don't want to take your money. You are, I don't know what market you're going to sell it in. I don't know where you're going to go with it at all. And if I say that this X is worth Y amount and you only get zero amount on it, you're going to ruin my reputation. I, you don't need me as an appraiser. What you do need is some of my advice to tell you where to take it or who to call and who I would suggest you deal with. Well, give me an idea. I, and let's say this was all oak furniture they were talking about. Um, Midwestern oak brought out in the 20s and 30s, which was very popular, oak furnishings. I said, well, you go into homes today and you will find very little oak. People aren't buying oak. People aren't buying antiques. This is what we just talked about in that antiques are not what they were because of the changing designs of what people are wanting in their home. Pottery barn, Ikea, um, stuff that you and I probably cringe at, many of us. The 1950s mid-century modernist design, some of those chairs that were uncomfortable to all get out to set in. <clears throat> some of the furnishings that like, look like, there's no class to that. Well, it has class today. And I have people that are much older, they'll call me and say, I've got this mid-century or this modernist stuff, it's blonde and it's uncomfortable chairs, I want to give it to Goodwill. I said, no, 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 don't, 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 don't give it to Goodwill. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 uh. Let me connect you with a buyer to have you given them an offer, and then I want you to call this auction house and you send it to the auction house and you call that buyer back and say, it's at that auction. Because what's going to happen, and I give him the, the buyer that, ha that will pay the most money and he gets ruthless when he gets to the auction house because he doesn't like the other two buyers there. There's three bu major buyers here in Phoenix that buy mid-century modern. <clears throat> and they get into a wonderful war. It's lovely to watch. So something that he would have paid $250 for the chair, he winds up paying five and six and $700 for the chair, and it can be in deplorable shape. Remember, authenticity of the chair and its originality brings more than a recovered piece. So you look at it and say, this is awful. Put it on the curb. Well, people put it in their house. Because you know the other big uh, design that's coming about? Are you ready? It's called the industrial. The industrial look. I mean, it does not look warm and fuzzy at all. I mean, you have file cabinets used for dressers and storage of clothes, and you have, I know, it's, you know, you know, uh-huh. Yeah, bare light bulbs hanging down. You know, it's like, it, it's, well, it's not my taste, and I don't mean to be t stepping on any of you industrialist views out there, or you might have children who have become into the industrial look on it, but that stuff brings a lot of money, a great deal of money. Uh, so you might have treasures in your house that's in style and design today that has a great deal of value, and I can give you the avenue of where you could go to have it hauled out and gotten rid of, and you enjoy the, the fruits of it, not your children. You're the ones that need to enjoy and deal with, or put it in the trust and let them have it later. So orderly liquidation versus forced liquidation. Forced liquidation is um, you call... X dealer or X person, they say, I want to get rid of this. And you, he's the third person in. You say, what will you give me for it? $10. Okay, take it. You are forced to sell it to that person because you're sick of it all. You're sick of calling people in. You don't want them in anymore, so you just take it. Well, you remember I said this chair was sold for $700. You just lost a great deal of money because you did it forced. The other form of liquidation, which I push, is orderly liquidation primarily at auction. I do not believe in a state sale. You want to know why? You want to know why? <laughs> um, estate sales, there are too many estate sales specialists who have friends. Uh -huh. And those friends get there first. And they sell them to the 
friend for the deal that they can get. And you, after an estate sales specialist isn't around anymore, all those friends disappear because they're not getting the deals for it. An estate sale is not transparent. Your heirs or you have no real idea for what some of those things sold for. She can give you a list or he can give you a list of what's on the estate sale and say, here, this is what this sold for. Is it really the truth? Is it? Or is it a smoking gun of the possibility of the truth? And when we deal with very contentious estates, and I'm going to tell you, I've been on court with very contentious estates. And that's where I've come to the proponent of auctions. Because the estate sales specialist that I challenged couldn't support anything. Um, why do I say an auction? Transparency. And transparency is you know what it's sold for, and you know who bought it. And that's, that's the key. <clears throat> Not only that, it, the auction has all of you out there to bid on this item. All of you. And, it will, and if it's hot in the market, because all of you don't know what's hot in the market. You don't know who are the dealers or the people are out there buying. Um, there's, and I'm going to give you the name of the one auction house that I, I, I trust. I've lived in Phoenix for over 50 years. And I, I taught at Cortez High School for 36 of those years. Mayor Stanton was one of my former students. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Kahn, the chief of the fire department, is one of my former students. And the auction house people, he and his wife are former students of mine, and then they're, they're 50s now. They have been around for 50 plus years. It's been a family tradition. They have the lowest commission in town. They have the highest integrity in town. Every bank, every trust department, every attorney, every fiduciary that I represent, I say, send it to Brunk's auction, our Brunk's auction in Sun City. And I'm going to tell you the reason why, is that Sun City is alive and well with a lot of investors. And those investors are Canadian that are coming in and buying up properties for their getaways because you know what's happened to the Canadian dollar. Well, they have to furnish the houses. And we have an older group of people who still see value in older things and quality things. And they're buying their washers, their dryers, their cars, their furnishings at Bronx Auction. And I urge people who have a great deal of items that they want to get rid of, November, January, not December, January, February, and March are your major time to get the best money for the item. And when you send items to the auction, don't focus on one thing. You say, this chair is worth $50. Well, this chair brought $10, and this chair that you thought was worth nothing brought $200. I say, everything comes out in the wash. You look at the bottom line. Did I do well over it all? Don't highlight specific little items that think, that only sold for $10, good God, blah, 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 instead of looking at the end of it all. And what I like about Bronx, they'll take everything. Tired of your husband? Send him to the auction. <laughs> <coughs> so it's everything. They will take it. And um, I send them so much business. And again, I get no referrals, fees, nothing from them. It is a service that I apply to all of our clients that come through the door or people who call me and I'll say, and I'm, I'm thanked over and over, well, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for sending me this. Thank you for sending me there. Because someday I might need help and every day you and I are planting seeds of goodwill. And those seeds may come up tomorrow, they may come up next year, or they may come up from years from now. So the more seeds we plant, the more comes back to you in a harvest. And consequently, our appraisal business has grown substantially because of all the seeds that we've planted. And I invite you to give me a call anytime you want on any question that you have. I will dig out the Rolodex, or I'll turn you over to Ron, my uh, other senior appraiser, or I'll turn you over to Jeff, my youngest one, or <clears throat> Marco, uh, the, the median one. So we range in age from... 
38 to 68. And therefore, we know what the 38-year-olds are looking for. Jeff is into baseball, weird, the wild, the wacky, <coughs> the, the stuff that just makes me cringe. But he gets all excited about it. He knows all about baseball cards, sports memorabilia, because he likes that. He's, in, he's into that. Marco loves art. And he is all over art. Ron and I are into your kind of things. Um, I love old cars. We all like old cars. So with having a whole array of different interests and different ages in the group, we are able to uh, appraise and go into the research of everything. Because the secret is research. An appraiser, a good appraiser, researches things of value and has the comparables of what it's sold for, not what it's listed for, unless you're doing an insurance replacement one. Uh, and people don't try to screw the insurance company <coughs> at all. We do a great deal of insurance work. And I'm going to tell you a funny story about a woman who was a hoarder. Her house was a disaster. It got flooded. And... She kind of went away for a while because she thought she'd be able to get some more money for it. And she was going to hope that black mold would grow up the wall. Well, it didn't. So she got a candle with a sooty candle and tried to make black mold around her house <clears throat> and claiming the black mold into the whole thing. We were called in from the insurance company because it had reached a stalemate. And when we're called in, we have basically the final say. The insurance company relies upon us for the decisions that we make. Well, and he said, Tom, we haven't called in an expert on whether it's mold or not, but we think it's just soot from a candle or whatever. And I said, okay, but we need to verify that. So I called it the OSHA guy I know. He said, it's soot. And <clears throat> which she lost a great deal of her claim. But you are insured, all right? Even though you're attempting fraud, you're still insured to a certain level, all right? You're, you come under that level. And when we wound up appraising it, here's her level. It came in down here of, what, of the whole conditions of it. Um, I could tell you story after story after story of what people try to do to the insurance company. And they're really trying, they're really not doing you and I a justice because it affects our insurance rates. Because we're paying for their fraud uh, or their bad claim. Um, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> we have, I've talked to you about salvage value. Forced liquidation value, orderly liquidation value, market value. That's the market that we really look at. So if I came in and it's not a taxable estate, because if it's a taxable estate, Uncle Sam wants all the money he can get from you. And fair market value. I was going to bring in a little statue from 1981 that it was made for the 1984 of uh, failed Olympics in Los Angeles. It was put out by McDonald's, and it was Ollie, the eagle, the hurdle jumper. But it was 1981. Before 1984, it was a prerequisite model that was being used to push the trophies that they were making. The 1981 is worth around $200. The 1984s are worth around $15 to $30. And I was going to show you the difference if we're into the research that we do. Um, and anything that has a thousand dollars or more, we put in a comparable where that came about and the last sale within the market, not fair market. My Ron, my other senior partner, says, Ron, this was this is listed for two hundred and seventy-five dollars. That's the fair market value of it. He says, No, 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 that's replacement value. Replacement value, fair market value, they're basically the one and the same. Replacement, fair market. Because, ladies and gentlemen, are you going to buy something that isn't on sale today? Are you not going to buy something today that has not been marked down? <clears throat> are you not going to be dealing with something that you know that you are getting a deal on? Because that's the major thought of today. You and I are going to say, look what I bought for $25, and it was marked 60. 
You bought it for cheap. Per. Well, that's, that's the mindset. That's market. You and I rarely buy things at fair market value. Because fair market value means I'm a willing buyer, I'm a willing seller, but I'm not forced or any compulsion whatsoever to go buy it. Oh, that's nice, but I'm not paying that for it. You go on buy. Market value. You look at it and say, wow, that's $50. It's marked down from $150 on sale. But Ethel, you already have five of them. I don't care. I'll get rid of the other three, and I'll take that home, and I'll put it there. Um, you know, it's, we go into particularly women's closets, uh, and I think, oh, my God. <clears throat> How many feathers does a bird need to have? I mean, just clothes galore. And I, I say, if, the, if I sense that the lady has a good sense of humor, I said, okay, let me start with the skinny side and work that way. <clears throat> uh, because the skinny side clothes probably are out of style, and we're going to appraise those for donation value. This size of the closet are what you want to keep or your daughter's going to take. All right? So we start with the skinny and work that way. Uh, same way with shoes. Honey, you haven't worn those shoes since 1973. <clears throat> I can still see a stamp on the bottom of them. We save things, and they, be, they go from used clothing to vintage clothing. And vintage clothing has good sales, particularly, which is becoming the second largest holiday in the country, Halloween. It has surpassed Thanksgiving. Sad, isn't it? Um, tune in. Remember I said the youngest, my youngest employee? He's into all the horror genre, all, of the, all that stuff that just gives me the creeps. It's become a major entertainment vest. So I thought, Tom, do some research. Why is he interested in all this weird stuff? The weird stuff has become the norm. Um, I was telling Laura, I think, no, you, John, about the 13th floor. Anybody know what I'm talking about, 13th floor? Okay, see there? All these people know about 13th floor. 13th floor is the largest fright house in the country. They have them in every major city. I think there's 10 of them. City of uh, here is their experimental one. So anything that's new in the fright house industry is at that area. It costs $45 for you to go through to have the P1 scared out of you. And that's for the quick line. That means you're only there for 45 minutes instead of four hours and 50 minutes standing in line. Denver, they had a five-hour wait to go through 13th floor. Um, and <clears throat> so with that amount of people who are going through, the zombie look, etc., we're dealing with all kinds of clothes and things that have a great deal of value, uh, particularly in the vintage, because they are using the vintage and they turn it into zombie clothes. They do it all sorts of things with it. So you have value in your closet. Some of those things you haven't put on a long time. Um, so market value. Um, market value is what the trade will pay for it. Remember I, I said to you, if you have sterling, silver, gold, etc., you're going to sell it at a market value. You're not going to sell it at a liquidation value. You're not going to sell it at an orderly liquidation value. But I, I'll come back to silver in just a moment on orderly liquidation value. You want somebody who's going to pay you market value. Meaning that, let's say you have this wad of gold, and I'll make up a number. He's going to offer you $100, and, he's, and a good, good one will say, this is really worth $125 in meltdown. I want to make $25 on it. I want to make at least 15% or 20% on it. So the, the one man that I'll send you to, he will tell you that. And he's buying it at market value, what the tradesmen buy it for. All right? Sterling silver. If you had sterling silver, particularly uh, sterling coins, or coins, 1922 silver dollar, I would say, take your chances and send it to Brunks. Because there are about four or five survivalists who go to the auction, and they believe the country's going to hell in a hanging basket and that the money's not going to be worth anything, and you're going to need silver and gold. And they can afford to buy silver. 
So I have seen 1922 silver dollars go as much as $36 each when they're there fighting over the dollars. And I've seen them go as low as $19 each. And it's more than what you can sell them for and meltdown value because they are hoarding every amount of silver that they possibly can. And I wouldn't know that if I didn't go to the auction at least once to twice a month of what's happening. I go to four major auctions in the valley, so I know what, what's happening around. I rotate, because that's what's telling me is going on in the market. That tells me what people are buying and how they're buying. Um, and if you hire an appraiser, say, what was the last auction you went to? What did you learn from that auction? What's selling? And if they say, well, I haven't been to an auction, you are dealing with an appraiser who is not educating themselves into the marketplace today. Um, the market here is different from the market in, um, say, Minnesota. At the arc auction two weeks ago, they sold a speedboat, one of these little powerboat things. And I said to Richard, I said, Richard, it's going to go between $3,000 and $3,800. That's what it's going to go for. Well, Tom, they want $4,500 for it. I said, they ain't going to get $4,500 for it because Lake Pleasant doesn't have that many of them, and there's not that many people who are going to go running around Lake Pleasant on that thing. Now, if we can move this to Minnesota, it would go between $4,800 to $5,800 because that's where the market is for it. So we, I said, if I had to appraise it here, I would appraise it for what I just told you, and I would specify in the middle of it $3,500 because... As an appraiser, I cannot give you a between this and this. I have to come to a specific number, and I have to justify that number to you. If I give you a verbal, and I'll say, well, your teacups, um, which about two years ago, they were really hot for wedding gifts and wedding parties, and they would put your name on it. You can take the teacup home from that. They were hot, and they were going anywhere between $15 and $25. Not so much anymore, because something new has hit the wedding industry. I don't know what it is, but it's not teacups. Um, but teacups, uh, you can get them anywhere today between $7.50 to $12.50. That's where the teacup market has gone to from two years ago to where it is now. Boring. Any of you have Shelly? Shelly has maintained its value. So turn your little teacups over and it says Shelly on it. Those are going between $20 to $35. Shelly. Uh, that's the only one that has maintained some degree of value. All right. Fair market value. When we are told by the government that we have to appraise things at fair market value, all right, you have what we call household appreciable items in your house. Used furniture. Used furniture goes. I have people who call me, Tom, I paid $14,000 for this dining room table and the buffet that goes with it. I said, that's nice. <clears throat> you're not going to get $14,000 for your dining room table. It would be like me coming in and saying, well, your, your five-year-old car that you paid $28,000 for, you're not going to get $28,000 for your car. It's used. It's been driven. And you have, well, this table's in perfect condition. Okay, your car's set in the garage. You know, it has 5,000 miles on it. It's still used. And that same thing applies with it. And people don't want china cabinets anymore. They're passe. You know what they're buying them now for? They first see the front. What, does it, is it all this frilly uh, uh, Mediterranean style with appliques on it and carved wood, et cetera, that would just clash in that modernist home? That doesn't have much value. China cabinets at auction go for $40 to $100. That's it. So they will take the top part of the cabinet off and leave it and take the bottom part of the cabinet, and they're being used to put television sets on. So if you want to clean out your china cabinet and redecorate, you may use the bottom part of your cabinet for the television and get rid of the other part because it's passe. The same way with the entertainment system. Those entertainment cabinets. You remember when uh, amois were hot? And they were in every house, and half of Europe had set all of their amois over here, and they were in every other house. Well, now they're all for sale. 
because the big screen television sets don't go in them. The entertainment systems do not go in them. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't use them. And so they're hot out on the market. I don't care how beautiful they are. I don't care how old they are. I don't care if Marie Antoinette's head was stored in one of them. They are not worth it, what they were. They are passe. So decorative style, decorative influence, influences the value of what you have in your house and what it is on the market. Uh, <clears throat> when I told you oak furniture earlier, um, circa 1990, I'm going to be shutting up here in a few minutes. I think I've bored you to death. Uh, we have oak furnishing. Let's go into the computers. And boy, you wanted to make sure you had a nice computer desk to put everything on, and it's all that nice laminate or veneer oak big computer desk. Do we use big computers anymore? No. And something that may have cost you five, six, eight hundred dollars for it, you're lucky to get fifty dollars for it because people don't want it. And the demand and changing in styles affects the value of the items in your house. Um, People, I'm going to return to what I was talking about earlier. You have a job, if you have a trust, to begin identifying the items that's in your house that could be contentious, provoking. You all have a job to have an inventory appraisal of the items in your house to give to your trust attorney to be part of your trust as an avenue of what you have. And I urge you, ladies, get your jewelry done. And I urge you, how many of you, a sad story later, how many of you have a, a safety deposit box? Good. I want you to put two cards in it. I want you to put your trust attorney's card in it, and I want you to put your insurance card in it, and if you have my card, you put my card in it. Because I guarantee it, when something happens, you may have been moved to another uh, uh, downsize. Things may happen. Paperwork gets lost. Who you dealt with gets lost. But I guarantee it, when it's in the safety deposit box, they'll find it. And I have been called because my card has been found in a safety deposit box. Same way with the trust attorney, who card was found, and they had no idea what had, what, what had happened. <clears throat> so use your safety deposit box as such. My last piece of advice, if you have a safe at home, leave it open. Let the people know that you, you're, you're storing your liquor in it. Because I have dealt with the tragedies that have happened in Paradise Valley with the break-ins and the murders. And I spoke to a very large group of people saying, empty your safes, leave them open, let them you know have no value whatsoever in that house because they wanted you to be home to open that safe. Um, one gentleman I know very, very well, and he was broken into, he was tied up and uh, was threatened to be killed. And he talked his way out of it. He offered him a job. <laughs> he said, I don't have anything in the safe, and he didn't, because he had listened to me and had taken everything out of that safe. And he says, here's the combination, you know, and he's all tied up, and he says, let's change your life around. I, you know, I'm, I've, I, I can get you into construction. I can do anything for you. I don't want to work. Opened the safe up, slapped him around a little bit, and left. Didn't kill him. Uh, he was lucky. He was one of them. And I know you all know who I'm referring to. Um, so don't have the safe because your, your, your domestics or whoever comes in to clean your house or workers who come into your house or anything else know that you have a safe. And it's not a safe thing. Put the coins in the bank. Ladies, put your fine jewelry in the bank, in the vault. Or find somewhere that's innocuous to hide it, but not in a safe. Because that's just saying, look what I have. I've got a lot. Uh, Safes are, are basically going to gun owners because they have the gun safes, and that's to protect the, um, uh, the family from getting into it. 
Another story we did an appraisal of a man who had his gun safe at his restoration center of cars. And it was in kind of a sleazy part of town anyway. A guy broke in. The, the, uh, his employee was spray painting a car in the paint booth. And he demanded he, mo he open the safe. He refused. So he kind of pistol whipped him a little bit. He still refused. <clears throat> Stupid man. He thought he, he wound up killing him. And, <clears throat> and we wound up having to do the appraisal report of the guns that the police had that we had to appraise for the estate, etc. cetera. Um, there is nothing, nothing worth dying for of personal property. Nothing. Um, our lives are much more important than what we have hanging on our wall or what we have in our closet or what we have in our safe. So identify the items that you want appraised. I mean, <clears throat> you need to have an insurance writer on very, very high-end art. I mean, very high-end art. Not just decorative stuff. You need to have an insurance writer on guns. You need to have an insurance writer on jewelry. You need an insurance writer uh, on any very special collection. A very special collection. When I deal with people on insurance, <clears throat> I say most people have in, uh, replacement insurance value. And you ask the company, how much is my uh, jewelry uh, covered under this replacement? Most of it's $10,000. Ladies, most of your jewelry that you have on, is, that you have in the house, is $10,000. Your five carat diamond ring, et cetera, that you have on, wear it and enjoy it. Hide it somewhere when you take it off because you don't, you'll never get any joy out of it with a safety deposit box. But any of that very valuable jewelry that you only wear for special occasions, put it in the safety deposit box. Just have your bric-a-brac that you wear and enjoy that uh, uh, does, your, does your clothes in. But you need to have an uh, appraisal on it for insurance writing. And sterling silver. Um, coins. All of that needs to be on an insurance writer. Because if you had a lot of coins, and you shouldn't have them at home anyway, they will only pay you for the face value of it. They will not pay you the value of what it is in the market. So <clears throat> I'm giving you some things to think about. Whoever you use, you want an inventory. Um, and <clears throat> you might ask yourself, well, Tom's got me thinking. Think about it. Um, and see what you think you might want to do. Um, you know, since we are here on a charitable event and you are looking for things to do, we have done a number of homes where the contents have been left to a charity. And they don't want your bed. They don't want your pot and pans. They don't want your couch. They want check. All right? You don't want to burden a charity by saying, here's my house, have fun, clean it out. And, and you never told anybody that it was a level four hoarding house and that <clears throat> there was only one way in and out, and that was through the garage door. Uh, <clears throat> seriously, hire an appraiser to come in and do a orderly liquidation value of the estate. And we do it for fiduciaries, for trust attorneys, they want to know what this estate will bring at auction. And I'll come in and I'll give a, net, uh, a gross and a net, and I'm right on, right on target. So I can tell the charity, you, are, you will expect anywhere between seven to $15,000. Now, most of the estates are between seven and $15,000 winds up being left in, into. And they, the auction house, write the check to the charity and they know exactly, the attorney knows exactly what's the write-off of it. So if there's anything that you want to donate to charity, you can do it for, you can do it all by yourself for under $5,000. If it's over $5,000, you need moi. And one last story, because I have to be at Jennings Strauss Law Firm to talk to 10 attorneys on valuing in 20 minutes. <clears throat> so, we have um, 
I'm going to say it publicly. I do not support Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity has not done a justice to you who donate. And I'm going to tell you why. Is you have a contractor that says, I'll do all of this. You have $25,000 you can write off if you give it to Habitat for Humanity. Um, well, you have to have an appraiser. You have to have a verification of what is it really worth. Uh, and it has to be substantiated. And so Habitat for Humanity doesn't care at all. They get it. They write the little receipt that they received it. Your accountant does. And I get calls from my accountant and say, Tom, you have, did you go back and do this sort of thing? And I have, I've, I have done seven of those this year of bad jobs for Habitat for Humanity because they don't follow through by protecting the client, you who give. The one that I do endorse is Stardust. Stardust calls me, or they say, I'm donating to Stardust. They, I've never had a Stardust uh, come back on me. Well, the story is, the attorney, uh, I didn't know he was an attorney at the time, they were redoing their house. The, the uh, <clears throat> con construction guy said, well, you have about fifteen dollars to $20,000 here. You need an appraiser. He didn't even tell him an appraiser. She called me. And I said, how many people want old roll-out casement windows? How many people want a front door that's been hanging there for 25 years? How many people want um, gold uh, appliances that are in your kitchen? How many people want cabinets that have seen better days? It's not worth that. And I went through her whole house. She had some nice chandeliers, etc. And I said, you have about $7,800 here that's, do that's donatable. If you want to pay me $800, I'll do it all. However, you can do it yourself. Here's the list. Here's the values that I've done for you. And I'm not charging you for this. Is you can go in for $4,950. You fill all the reports out. You take the pictures. And you are scot-free. And there you are. That's where it goes. So people, if it's over $5,000, you call me. Because you need me. If it's under four thousand, uh, under five thousand dollars, you can do it yourself. You get your form eighty two, eighty three. Call me if you want any help with it. I'll tell you whatever you need, and as such. Well, I hope I didn't put you all to sleep. I hope I got you a few little bits of information that you probably already knew. And I'd like to end with the questions on the back. I said I had a little quiz for you. And I bet you already know, <clears throat> how many values are there to everything? Six. What's the lowest value? Salvage. What's the highest value? It's for the government. Fair market value. Can a thrift store be used to determine fair market value? Yes. Yes. Because remember, you have household appreciable items. I need to appraise your... 30-year-old couch at fair market value. Where am I going to find your, fair, your couch? At a thrift store. Um, replacement value is the same as insurance value? Yes. Is there a difference between fair market value and market value? Yes. Remember, fair market value is you walk by the $275 item because you're not going to pay that amount. You come back by and you say, oh, it's for $50. I'll buy it. You, are, you have a compulsion to buy it. $275, you do not have a compulsion to buy it because it's not a deal. <clears throat> if an estate is to be inherited and all items are going to be kept and the heirs are from across the country, should you ask the appraiser for fair market value or market value? Note, they're going to be inherited. And there's not a tax going on to it. Should it be fair market value or market value? Most states require fair market value. Arizona, they don't care. Uh, it can be market value. Market, for example, uh, market value for this table and chairs, you can go and buy them. It's used, nice little casters on it. I'll make the number up, $250 market value. Fair market value, well, uh, it's not on sale, $450. Would you rather pay taxes on $450 or $250? There is no conflict of interest for you to hire an estate sale company to do both the appraisal report and the estate sale. There is. Because the estate sale specialists, are they trained? 
Number two, they may recognize something and say, hey, I can get $500 for that. Uh, <clears throat> and they send it to you and say, we got $150 for it. You have no idea. You want an objective person who's going to be, give you the values, and then they're going to price accordingly, and it's going to be done at market value at the opening of the estate sale, and then on the second day and the third day, it's half off, 75%, or haul it out. You sell a complete state with a handgun, a car, all furniture, garage items, and jewelry along with a gold coin to a local liquidator. Have you done anything wrong? What one thing have you done wrong? The gun. You're correct. The gun is the big thing. There's only one auction house in town that I recommend to of selling guns. He's licensed. He brings good deals. And that's Pot of Gold out in West Phoenix. Guns bring good value. Never sell your guns to a dealer. They'll always give you much less money than when you put it out to the hungry sharks who are wanting to buy guns. And they're out there. The heirs have agreed to sell the remainder of an estate and it is to be sold by an estate sale specialist on a specified day. You learn that items have been sold at a preview before that advertised date. Is there a potential problem here? Major. Major. Because they have advertised the possibility of something that's going to be sold, and you get there and say, where is it? Or you've changed your mind, and you decided you want something. Well, I already sold it. Well, too bad, so sad to your dad. Mama hung you in the closet. It's gone. Um, so those are, are your little quiz times and some information for you. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to go. <clears throat> and if Laura... Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, my business cards are in the back there. Uh, my company information and all the phone numbers are on the handout for you. Um, and remember, recycle. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming today. Before you leave, I just want to take a few minutes. Because we're radio, you don't see the faces that make public radio happen sometimes. And so I'd like to introduce our staff over in the development team. Um, first and foremost is Laura Barton, who is saying goodbye to Tom. And Laura helped put this together. She takes care of our plan giving for the station. Thank you, Laura. And next is Claire Kerrigan behind the camera. Um, Claire takes care of all of your RSVPs. If you ever have a question about uh, your gifts to the station, she's a wonderful person to contact. Uh, she also does name badges really well, so we really appreciate Claire keeps us all in line. Uh, Tanya Alji uh, takes care of our member services, so if you have a question about your donation, Tanya, you want to raise your hand again? Emilio Cabrera, he runs our business member program and also our group 91.5, which is our young professionals group. Emilio does a great job and has been with us for how many years? Six, four years. Uh, Irma Di Nicola takes care of our marketing for the development operations. So if you get emails, those are uh, crafted by Irma and she does a great job for us as well. Maury Puzzi takes care of our leadership society. Uh, and Maria has been with us a couple years now and most recently came from public television as well. So uh, if you have a question about your leadership gift, Maury is your person. And Jeanette Richards, uh, she does all things behind the computer, helping us keep those donations in line and putting things into the system. So we appreciate Jeanette. And then finally, Brian Fergus. He is our membership manager. So when you receive direct mail, you can blame Brian and feel free to call him. Uh, Brian's been with us for a couple years and does a great job, and he too came from public television before he came here. So this is our development team, so feel free. Oh, and Rich Ripley, sorry. Rich is taking care of our events for the station. Rich will handle our first press wine auction, our 13th year, 12th year, coming up on March 8th. And also we'll be doing a travel and discover trade show downtown, so you'll hear more about that as we go along. So thank you again for coming. Feel free to contact any of these folks if you have any questions about public radio, and we're glad you could join us um, and watch for details for our next roundtable that should be coming up in the next few months. Thank you. <laughs>